So um, we're just going to introduce ourselves. I'm Jamie Bellotti Moses. I'm a board certified appellate um, specialist at Holland and Knight. Um, I've been doing appeals for 25, 26 years. Um, I know it's hard to believe I did them right out of high school. Um, but uh, I love appellate work very much, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to do appeals for the Guardian Ed Leiden program. Um, and I, I honestly, driving over here, thought there were going to be like five or six people in the room plus all the speakers. So to see this whole, whole room feel, filled is just fabulous. And I'm sure Thomasina is ecstatic. Um, Nancy's going to introduce herself. I'm her elderly assistant. I accompany her everywhere, and I pick up after her and mop up the mistakes. So we're there. You know, there are three parts of appellate proceedings. So we're going to divide this up into those three logical parts. Jamie's first. I'm second. I'm Nancy Gregoire. All right. And pretty much everybody knows Nancy in the appellate arena. I think we actually met serving on the appellate court rules committee or the board of governors. A hundred years ago. Hundred years ago. Um, when we were still chiseling out rules on tablets. So, um, who has handled a guardian ad litem appeal before? Oh, wow. So, the rest of you are genuinely interested in doing them for the first time. Yay! That's so exciting. Okay. So, just so you know, um, for those of us that are appellate practitioners by trade, um, it's kind of hard to get work nowadays. It really is. Clients want to settle, or they can't afford us, or whatever. There's a plethora of guardian ad litem appeals. You, every week, Joe, who you just met, sends us an email saying, who wants one of the five following cases? So you are now entering into a world where you will have an opportunity to do one appeal a month if you really want to. So welcome, congratulations, it's awesome. The, the only problem is um, the records are very large, I think. Those of you who have done it, would you agree the records are pretty large? Um, the, the, the same thing tends to get filed over and over again. So you know, you'll get an eight page brief <laughs> and a 1700 page record with a 500-page transcript. So it's, um, it, it, do not budget your time based on being able to write the answer brief on that it's only an eight-page brief that you're getting because the record is so large. I just want to give you that warning. So it sounds like I've now listened to Joe's um, presentation and Nancy listened to Carrie Ann's, and you've probably heard everything we're already going to tell you. So that's kind of why I'm stalling and yapping away, because you're gonna, you've probably already heard all of this. So I'm going to apologize in advance, and I'm sure Nancy is too, if, um, if you've already heard some of this. But we're here to talk about finality. There are three types of appellate. Let me back up even more. Who is an appellate practitioner by trade? OK, more people in the room. Who hasn't handled a single appeal before? Don't be embarrassed. Fabulous. Welcome to the club. That's awesome. Um, you either like to do them or you don't. You, you know, we've got our trial dogs that just like to hear themselves speak, ironically, as I'm standing up here talking. Um, but we do. We have the trial dogs that like to run in 15-minute motion or a 10-day trial, and they just want to boom, 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 boom. And we appellate geeks like to read and digest and write and spend, you know, my, every time I send my husband a text, I just spent the whole day writing a brief, I get a throwing up emoji in return. Because that's the last thing he, as a lawyer, wants to be doing. So those of you that have never done one, yet want to do one, uh, welcome and thank you. Um, I, and I also believe that you can't be a good trial lawyer unless you've handled an appeal. And you cannot be a good appellate lawyer unless you've handled trial work. In my humble opinion, you need to see what you're doing in court, how it turns out to something else at the appellate level, and then you need to see it the other way. So welcome to the club. But there are three types of appellate proceedings. One are final orders. When it's all said and done, you've got a final judgment, go hence without day, or for which let execution issue. It's done. 
it's over, um, it's, it's final, right? Those are easy, actually they're not, but those, you can understand them conceptually. The second time, I'm gonna jump down, the second type are appeals of non-final orders. Hi, Judge. Um, appeals of non-final orders, rule 9.130. Those are specifically listed um, non-final orders that can be appealed. And when you think of them, if you look in the rules, it's very obvious why we, the appellate court rules committee, ratified by the Supreme Court, has determined those can be appealed. I just had a hearing yesterday on a motion to compel um, appraisal. If I lose, if I win that, okay, I got what I wanted, neither side, my other side can't appeal because he can address it later. But if I had lost that hearing, that's an immediately appealable non-final order because if I should have been entitled to an appeal, then what's the benefit of appealing it when it's all said and done and I've gone through years of litigation over a case and I really should have just been able to go to appraisal? So there are certain things like that that it's been determined you can appeal them right now. In the family law arena, it's the right to custody of children. There's a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of things. But when someone walks into your office and says, is this appealable? Your first reaction is always, well, do you have a final judgment? And they say no, but don't let them leave the room till you pull out your rules book and say, well, let's see if we can appeal it under 9.130. Okay, so don't ever forget that there's an opportunity. In the GAL arena, I'm gonna be totally honest with you, I've never handled a non-final appeal in the guardian ad litem arena. Every single one of my appeals has been um, final. I see Nick is thinking and pondering. Have you, Nick, ever had one? I don't think I have. Dwayne? Fine. Joe? Uh, anybody? I, I'm not aware of it yet. But I want you to be aware of that rule in case someone calls you about it. At a minimum, pull out the rule book and look at it, okay? Um, and then the other type of appeals are extraordinary petitions. Petition for cert, petition for writ, mandamus, all of that. Has anybody experienced in guardian ad litem appeals handled a petition? Okay, Nick, what kind? Uh, mandamus. Okay, mandamus, all right. So, and you travel under different rules and different deadlines, which is very critical. And one of the most important, or just the way people can really get messed up, in final appeals, the clerk prepares the record. In non-final appeals, you've got to send everything up. So you can really jeopardize yourself by waiting for a record on appeal that is never going to be sent up in a non-final appeal. Okay? All right, yay. Um, Appeals of non-final orders. Obviously, it starts with the notice of an appeal, okay? Um, and, you know, I'm a, I, I caught myself saying something, and I, I, I was gonna say that um, I have handled a couple of these where the party has represented themselves. Um, don't underestimate pro se's at all. That's all I'm gonna say. Do not underestimate pro se's um, in family law or this arena. Don't underestimate them. That's all. I'll leave it at that. But the timing of a notice of appeal begins on the rendition of an order. Rendition is de um, defined under Florida Rule of Civil Procedure 9.020H. It requires a signed written order filed with the clerk of the court. Signed written order filed with the clerk of the court. Um, side note, because we have time to kill. A very dear friend of mine who is a board certified appellate specialist um, was elected to the bench on his third day. He, um, <laughs> he made a ruling. The state didn't like it, so they appealed him right then and there. And he was able to reply, I haven't signed an order yet, so no you haven't. Um, which I just think is kind of, kind of fun for, that's appellate geek humor. I hope you like it. So, um, one critical thing about final appeals. There are authorized and timely motions that delay rendition of a final order, okay? Motion for rehearing. If it's a final order, you can file a motion for rehearing directed to it 
that delays rendition of the order. If it is not a final order and you move for rehearing, it doesn't delay rendition of that, not rend it wouldn't be rendered because it's not final, but it doesn't delay the time for a notice of appeal. So if you've got a non-final order, okay, you know it's non-final, but you move for rehearing because you, you, you think you can convince the judge that she is wrong. Just keep track of your 30 days for the notice of appeal of that non-final order because your motion for reconsideration or rehearing or whatever you call it is not going to toll that 30 days. Does that make sense? Is there anybody that doesn't get that? Don't be embarrassed. Okay. It doesn't mean you lose your right to ultimately appeal that non-final order. It just means you lost the time to appeal it early. Okay? That makes sense, right? Okay, good, good, good. Um, and if you have a notice of appeal and a timely, because sometimes when you're dealing with inexperienced practitioners, angry practitioners, angry pro se's, that notice of appeal gets filed like the next day, okay? Um, you can, if, if a timely, if a motion has been filed that's authorized and timely, you can give notice to the appellate court that there is an authorized and timely motion outstanding that needs to be considered, and the appellate court, the appellate court will relinquish jurisdiction for the trial court to do so. Okay? So if the way things go, you've got an outstanding motion for rehearing, but you get a notice of appeal filed over here, you can alert the court so that the clock doesn't start running. Okay? Does that make sense? And in fact, there's a rule directed to that. I can't remember what the number is. Um, and the notice of appeal, if it has been filed, doesn't start, the clock doesn't start running until the post, the authorized and timely motions are ruled upon. Um, if no notice of appeal has been filed yet, it's not due until those have been ruled upon. Um, now that's a really scary time in your life while you're waiting for things to be ruled on and you're thinking, is this a final order really? And was my motion timely and all of that? It's, it's, it's a scary time in your life. That's a wake up in the middle of the night like, oh my God, did I miss the deadline? Um, so. Um, and if there is no motion tolling rendition, then the notice of appeal is due in 30 days. If you are getting an, an appeal from the guardian ad litem program, this will have already all been done, okay? You don't have to worry about filing the notice of appeal. You don't have to worry about um, any cross appeals. I have not handled a GAL matter that had a cross appeal going. Has anybody? No. So you don't have to worry about stuff like that. Um, and then, I don't know if this was mentioned earlier, but the Guardian Ad Litem program um, helps you immensely in handling appeals. Has that been mentioned earlier? Um, they do notices of appearance. They give you a form answer brief. Like, it's already, they tell you, you know, big heading, small heading, bold, underline. You get a whole section on the standard of review already provided for you. Um, yes, sir. Yes. Yes. They're, com they're so, so helpful. Um, really, I have, um, with time constraints, I have literally just handed my statement of the facts and argument section to Justina and said, there's my answer brief, and she's made it look perfect. Um, and then they'll file it for you if you're short of staff or, you know, one day my assistant was out and I really didn't want to deal with the portal, so she did it. Um, they're incredibly accommodating, incredibly accommodating. Um, so I heard Joe talk about the record. Um, you know, the clerk prepares the record. Um, you're not gonna, uh, let me word this correctly. Our state uh, goes out of its way in these proceedings to make sure that people have representation, that there's a record on appeal, and all of that. So you're never going to have to worry about whether there was a transcript. There always is one. Um, and 
many of these people in the TPR proceedings are provided counsel, um, and good counsel, good counsel. It really is impressive, um, some of the work that some people do. Um, I say some because others have, uh, I'm not, you're laughing, I'm not trying to be disrespectful, but you can tell in the initial brief where the appellate lawyer, because it's always different than the trial lawyer, doesn't really think there's any merit to the appeal, but she has to write this brief for the mother that has lost her child, um, and you can pretty much tell. Um, and I have found, and I um, respect this immensely, they are very, very honest with the facts, including the really bad ones against their clients. Really bad ones, like yes, the mother is a meth head, but um, I'm joking and that's inappropriate, but I'm saying they are incredibly honest with the facts. These attorneys that are hired to handle these appeals, um, in my opinion and experience so far, are incredibly ethical um, and do a really nice job with what they're presented with. Um, so again, don't underestimate it, even if it is just an eight-page brief. I have also found that those attorneys that are hired don't just throw everything at the wall and see, see what sticks. These briefs have two to three arguments on appeal. And for those of us that have handled civil appeals and in the family law arena, I've gotten 10, 11, 12 issues on appeal. Um, not here, you get two or three really discreet ones. Yes, do you have a question or are you stretching? All right, okay. Um, uh, jurisdiction, the appellate court has jurisdiction over any ruling or matter before entry of final judgment if it has not already ruled. So, um, you know, they, they can go back and look at things. I, I, I will tell you in these types of appeals, it's just traditionally what was decided at the TPR. I've had a couple where they've complained of continuances a couple months prior or not letting their attorney out or letting their attorney out or something like that. But traditionally, it's the final hearing and what was presented or decided at the final hearing. Um, the initial brief, it's due to be filed within 70 days of the notice. For those of you that are experienced appellate practitioners, and at least in the 5th DCA, you're used to that window of opportunity for a mediation and it delays appeals a little bit, that's non-existent in these. So just keep in mind um, when 70 days from when the notice of appeal is filed. And another thing, if you're doing this work, um, extensions of time are not looked upon favorably in this arena at all, at all. You know, if you're an experienced appellate practitioner, you're accustomed to one or two extensions of time, you can file your notice of agreement of extension of time, or you can even file a motion if the other side's being a jerk and it's gonna be granted. In the guardian ad litem arena, the longest extension I've ever asked for is two weeks. And I had a darn good reason, like, I just got the brief, I'm leaving the country, I'm gonna be gone for nine of the 14 days, can I please have two weeks? Um, so do not expect that you can ask for an extension of time. Absolutely do not expect that. Same experience for you, Nancy? Or have you never had to ask for an extension? There have been emergencies, yeah. and we'll grant emergencies generally not just because you're behind in your workforce. Yeah, it's gotta be an emergency, truthfully. Um, and let's, we understand the purpose. Um, we need finality for the child if, the, if there's been a TPR, or we need some sort of moving forward towards reunification if it was wrong, right? We need to, we need to get the process started again for mom to get the child back. Um, so there, there cannot be a delay in these types of proceedings. Um, this is just a general appellate issue regarding stays and how you have to request it in the trial court first. You don't request it at the appellate court, you request it at the trial court. I have not seen a stay filed in, an, in a guardian ad litem appeal. Um, again, the, the purpose is to get things moving fast um, for, um, for the child and the families. Um, Oral argument, I've never had one in a GAL case, but Thomasina just asked me to do one at the third DCA in March. 
Um, so I'll get 10 whole minutes down there. Um, uh, but I'm excited. I'm excited to do one in a guardian ad litem case. So um, I'm a little nervous that they're granting it because I don't know why. You traditionally get rulings exceptionally fast in these ap appeals. Um, two, three weeks, oh, two, three weeks you'll get a ruling. So the fact that they're not ruling and granting oral argument, I've got to make sure I'm on my game. And then there are motions for rehearing allowed under Rule 9.330. Um, I have. I have had one of those, one motion for rehearing of a ruling in a guardian ad litem case, but it was inexperienced and, you know, it was a person just rehashing what they'd already rehashed on appeal and you're not going to get anywhere with that. Um, and now we turn it over to Nancy. Clicker, that one. I'm going to turn off. So one thing I do want to mention, one of the biggest helps is not only the help that you get from Thomasina's office, but from Joe. Joe, once you get on his beg list, will send you periodically a list of the appeals that the GAL needs help with. And in each instance, he tells you the number of pages, the issues, when the answer brief is due. You get as much help as you could possibly need. So for any of you who haven't accepted one, give it a shot. And then if you get into hot water, you know, we're always there to help you. All of us are always there to make sure that the best interests of the children are, are what gets accomplished. Um, and on that note, the other two parts of appellate proceedings are Rule 9100 and 9130. And you know, th there's been some talk about 9130. I was chair of the Appellate Court Rules Committee when Judge Schwartz of the third DCA was on there. And I don't know if you remember Judge Schwartz, but he sent a shiver of fear down your spine, even if you weren't in the same room with, room with him. So his goal was to eliminate Rule 9130 because the feds and no other state has an equivalent rule. Florida is very unique in this. Meanwhile, 9130, depending on the, 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 the tides and the, and the cycle of the moon, goes up and everything's included, or down and nothing's included. And that's, right now, a lot is included. And the reason that the Rules Committee and the Supreme Court have decided to do that is because without Rule 9130, if anything happens in the course of the proceedings, you only have 9100 available to you. And the Rules Committee and the Supreme Court said, yes, but the standards are so high. Remember, certiorari is a departure from the essential requirements of law with no appellate remedy, no final appellate remedy available. The mandamus is no discretion in the lower tribunal. Those standards for the extraordinary petitions are very high. So along came 9130. But if you're stuck with 9100, and I agree with Nick and, and Jamie, we don't get them very often. But there are five. CERT, mandamus, prohibition, habeas corpus, and quo warranto. CERT is probably the most common because it involves discovery. If you're involved in some proceeding and the trial court says, well, turn over all your attorney-client work product, that's a CERT petition. These must be filed with an appendix containing all the documents you're relying on. They're filed with the clerk of the appellate court. And for certiorari, it's 30 days or you're out. You know, lots of times I'll have a trial attorney say to me, well, I did a motion for reconsideration. I say, that's great, but that doesn't help me. That only helps you. The 30-day rule is unforgiving. You can do the motion for reconsideration, as I think Carrie Ann said, but you either have to have that heard and ruled on within 30 days or let it go, because you've got to get to the appellate court. You can ask for um, the, the jurisdiction be reversed to the trial court while your petition is pending to have that heard, because it might obviate the appellate proceedings, but you've got to get your petition filed. And it's not the nice notice of appeal, wait, file my brief. It's file the petition. Back in the old days, it was a two-standard uh, proceeding, not anymore. Th oddly enough, and, and while I was on the Rules Committee, I used to argue about this all the time, uh, mandamus, prohibition, habeas corpus, and quo warranto, there's no petition. Quo warranto is, how do you have the right to hold that office? Habeas corpus is, you can't keep that body either in jail or out of the control of the court. And yet there's no time frame on those, only cert. 
um, with the petitions, a reviewing court may or may not accept them. And depending on the judge you get, the judges you get, they may say, we're not taking this. This, I represent an insurer, and we go from county to circuit court. If we want to get, in the old days, to district court, it had to be by petition of second tier cert. Would never accept them. Didn't matter what the error was at the circuit court level, would not accept them. After you file the petition, there's this waiting game, because the next move isn't by the respondent. The next move is by the court. The court has to either issue an order directing response or denying or dismissing your petition. Till the court does that, the other side doesn't have to do anything. So when I'm a Pelley or respondent in, in these matters, I hold my breath praying that it'll just get dismissed and I won't have any work to do. Um, oral arguments are seldom permitted. And if there is a petition on a time-sensitive matter, a stay may be necessary. You know, I can think of one. What if in these guardian ad litem proceedings, the court says, well, you know, I know that the child is in protective custody right now, but I think the child is better off back with the mother. You would, if the, if the trial court won't give you immediate relief from that, you're gonna have to get to an appellate court because that may be in the absolute worst interest of the child. I love the dog. I found the dog online and I tried to find the dog to adopt. I couldn't find the dog. But obviously he's a very obedient dog. Stays are not that easy. Um, you have to ask the trial court for a stay and if the trial court refuses the stay, then you have it reviewed in the appellate court. And that's a very electric process. You, you've got to, you know, all hands on deck for that one. And then the other writs. Rule 9130 is expanding all the time. I have one now, a trial court denied arbitration in a case where the contract clearly calls for arbitration. So that's a 9130. Again, this is a little more relaxed than the extraordinary petitions. You file the notice, brief is due in 15 days. You can get extensions if you need them. But again, like petitions, no motion tolls the time to file the notice. If you get a wrong ruling below, say on venue or subject matter jurisdiction or arbitration or an injunction, you can do a motion for reconsideration, but it doesn't toll the time to file the notice of appeal. Again, the initial brief has to be accompanied by an appendix which has to contain everything you think is relevant that was in the record below. You can't shove something into the appendix that wasn't before the trial court. And again, the stay is a two-step process, motion below and then motion above. Um, these types of, and this is rare for you guys, but it could happen, a venue, injunction, personal jurisdiction, immediate possession of property, uh, family law matters, immediate monetary relief, that's like a temporary appellate fees, things like that. Enforceability of a settlement agreement. Again, this barely, ha rarely happens in GAL proceedings, but in case you do appeals outside GAL proceedings. And on that note, I think every single one of us, I think I speak for Jamie and everybody else, we're a phone call away. We're, we're the, the best providers of free advice. If you need us, call us. Because if we don't know, we're happy to learn something new and help you help both of us. So give us a call. Disqualification of counsel is another one that might be of, of importance in GAL proceedings. Although the judges, I only read the transcripts and the records, the judges that I've seen in these DCF GAL proceedings are abundantly resourceful, eminently bright, and extremely fair. I haven't seen any one of them that would you know, warrant any kind of a disqualification. And it's back to Jamie. Do you want to keep going? I don't care. You were so okay. Quick. You were the, so quick. the reason we gave you these is because there is a natural and logical order when you brief. No matter, you know, I, I always think when you do a brief, and I've been doing this literally into a different century, literally. When you brief, you want those facts. By the time your court reads the facts, you must be absolutely, absolutely accurate. Don't use adjectives, don't use adverbs, but by the time the court finishes reading the facts, the court should say, hmm, I think I got a rule for this one. The argument should be almost secondary to your statement of the facts. 
So when you're ordering these issues, you want to order these facts so that they follow the law that you're going to later recount. And de novo issues are always going to be your friendliest because the standard for review is whether, whether the record, a cold, hard record with no discretion for the trial court, supports or destroys, depending on which side you're on. And then these, I just gave you sample cases that you can cite. They're all fairly recent cases. Um, summary judgment, for me, that's always a big issue because I represent insurance companies. We always get summary judgment entered against us. When you frame the issues as a appellant, you want to load the issues with as many specific facts as you can while being absolutely, you know, someone said it earlier, I don't remember who it was, maybe Joe, we only have our credibility and our reputation. One false step and it'll take you forever to recover. It takes years to build it up. It takes years for a court to say, I know you and I trust you because you've never misled me. And one bad brief to have the court say, I don't trust this one anymore. So although you need to be accurate, you need to load it with as much favoring you as you can. For the appellee, in contrast, you want to load it in the other direction. And if you're going to, you know, there's an old, old case from the Florida Supreme Court. I can't even remember the name of it, but what, um, Dania Highlight, somebody versus Dania Highlight. What the Supreme Court said is the appellee respondent should always frame the brief so that it answers the brief of the appellant petitioner. So that if appellant petitioner puts issue one, I am supposed to also deal with that issue one. I can rephrase it. I can explain why it shouldn't be issue one. But if I can't do either one of those things, then I have to just put in a not or something like that. But I'm supposed to follow that same format. So that uh, the uh, Supreme Court said the issues are joined for the court. So that's why I put in that little hint. And I think, I think that's it. So I want to add a couple things. Back to Jamie. Um, the, the example she just gave about framing issues, I was at the second DCA on an argument. Um, I was the appellee. I walked up and just got fried by one of the judges, I won't even say who it is, that said his law clerk was very mad at me because I took the issues out of order. Um, and you know, I wanted to be sarcastic and say they couldn't just cut and paste. I mean, come on. Um, the appellant had the issues out of order. I mean, the law provides the first issue to consider is one, then two, then three, and she started with three and then went one and two, so I just answered in the appropriate order. I have learned now that if you feel you must change the order of the issues, A, explain it right away, and then B, after your heading, put in parentheses, if it's your issue number one, I put in my heading responsive to issue number three of appellant. So then they can cut and paste. Um, I still won that argument, but to, to get, I mean, he really read me the riot act, at oral, at riot act at oral argument. It was quite embarrassing. And I just didn't, I thought I was doing the right thing, um, and apparently I wasn't. So I learned a lesson. Um, Two more things and then we can open it up to questions or take a break or move on so people can save the 15 minutes to walk to parking. Um, DCF, if you're doing guardian ad litem appeals, DCF submits a brief as well. And those briefs are very well written. Just so you know, they're exceptionally well written. I've actually received the DCF brief before mine was due and told Thomasina, let's just join in DCF's brief. Um, I got a 50 page monster last Tuesday. Um, and I just said, I cannot add anything to this. It is such a good brief. So we just joined. Um, and DCF has joined in my briefs before. Um, and so that is something that I would consider. I've also adopted their supplemental facts instead of writing my own supplemental and then written the brief. Um, sometimes, uh, you know, Someone has the father and someone has the mother because there's been a TP TPR for both of them. And I really like the father's brief. I'll join in that one or whatever. But just, just keep that in mind. 
And one other thing in appeals and guardian ad litem cases, um, the only problem I have found is that the judge doesn't normally write the orders. Has anybody found that? It's, it's normally been submitted by DCF or someone else. And sometimes there are things in the order that are argument, argumentative or adversarial, and I don't like what's said in the order because I, I can tell it's been written by someone other than the judge, and therefore I don't quote from the orders, the final order themselves, actually very much. I prefer to say what the judge said at the hearing. Um, I go back to that. Or if I really like a fact that the judge, the judge said in the order, I may say the court found, and I'll quote the court a sentence or two, and then I go to the record to show where it actually happened. Because there's a word I don't like in the judge's finding, or again, I find it. Um, and I mean, I hate to say this, but the, how I know that is the same typo that's in the final judgment is in the motion that was filed, or it's in the report that was filed, or something like that. So that, that's how I know. Um, and I don't want that, the suggestion of that, to be the reason why it might get reversed. So um, don't, you know, really, really look at these records. Re the, the hearing will give you all you need at least in the guardian ad litem appeals, and I do um, Harbor House's appeals in Central Florida, and I don't care what's been filed. What's said at the hearing is enough <laughs> to either get it reversed or to get it affirmed, and I feel the same way with the TPR, uh, with these matters. Everything comes out at trial. It really does. Um, Kathleen, do you, have you had these trials? All day long. All day long, okay. Okay, okay, so am I right that everything comes out at trial? Everything comes out at trial, and, and um, you couldn't have said it better. We really appreciate the hard work that goes into getting the proposed order, but we are real careful to make sure that it aligns with the facts that, that we want to find, because otherwise, and, and, and we always, the adverse, the adversaries, yeah. we, don't, we don't want those. And I'm not saying that they're there, I'm just saying you guys are just careful. Right. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I hope to appear in front of you again soon. No, I'm kidding. Um, but I, I will say then um, that you said the facts come out. Um, oh, much of what the judge does in the TPR hearings are credibility determinations. So if you are the appellee, you want to frame everything in a credibility determination by the court, right? The, I mean, the, the judge is the one who saw the mother's reaction when this happened or when that happened or whatever. You, you, only the judge can make that credibility determination. Appellate courts do not sit as a seventh juror or the second judge. They don't. We need to defer to what she decided how it came across at trial. So if you're the appellee, you want to frame it that way. So does anybody have any questions? Um, just, yes, sir. How are you? I'm wondering if there's a legal decision by the Superior Court of Rhode Island case. Does the automatic state provision for government entities come into play, or is the fact that it's going back to the trial and it's going to be the same? So what was asked? Um, I wished I hadn't got up to say a few things because I don't know the answer. The question was, if the guardian ad litem program appeals is the automatic stay in, in effect because it's a government entity. I really don't know. Does anybody, Kavita, you say no? You don't know. Um, Kavita is one of our fabulous um, OCBA legal aid attorneys, um, top-notch attorney. Yes, do you know? No. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Do you want to explain? Better and louder? Yes. So I was going to introduce myself at the end of this. I'm Sarah Goldfarb. I'm the pro bono coordinator for Guardian Ad Litem Program, and I oversee the Defending Best Interest. So if anybody has any questions about the program, please come see me during the break. 
um, and we can get you signed up or get you more information or whatever you would like. But to answer the question, no, the governmental stay does not apply when the GAL takes an appeal, but there is a stay provision generally in this case for termination orders in particular. But they are fast track, so things move quickly um, in the efforts of achieving permanency. How often does, does the GAL ever appeal? We do appeal sometimes. Those typically stay in house. Um, we have uh, four appellate lawyers. I'm one of them, um, and we anything that we are appealing or petitioning, 90% of the time stays with us. We have had some pro bono um, attorneys do a petition or two for us over the course of the last couple of years. Okay, great. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I still get confused with what is a final order versus a non-final order, and I know you very um, eloquently explained it, um, but could you give me just a little bit more direction on that issue, because I do still struggle with that sometimes. And obviously it wasn't that eloquent, no. Um, so if the judge still has to do something in the case, it's not final, you know what I mean? I mean, like for example, um, and now I'm not going to be able to give one because I'm sitting right here. Nancy, go ahead. This comes up all the time. There are orders granting motions. You get to the very, very end and you look at the penultimate paragraph and it says plaintiff's motion is granted, defendant's motion is granted. That's not an order that has any finality to it. If it's a money judgment, it must say, judgment is entered in the amount of uh, let execution issue. If it's a judgment in the case, kinds of cases we have, the difference between granting the motion is, and the child is remanded to the custody of Department of Children and Families. That's finality. Then you have a final appeal. In the vast majority of non-GALDCF, you're just looking for a lead execution issue or um, a defendant go hence without day. It's, if you look in the appellate rules, 9.800, it'll show you. But all the time, we get appeals from orders granting, granting the defendant's motion to dismiss, granting the plaintiff's motion for summary judgment. They're non-final, non-appealable, and there are so many opinions out there written with, you could, you could sense the court's frustration, saying, this is not final, you can't appeal it. Appeal dismissed. So if you look for that, and the other thing is, any one of us, we've, you know, we've been down this road so many times now after 40 years here, um, email, us, email us the order, and we'll say, yes, this is our gut, this is what it is. Well, and, and Kavita, the case law also says as well, like for example, um, attorney's fees. Being in, uh, outside of this arena, you get an award for attorney's fees, but there's no amount, that's not a final order. Sure. Yes, sir. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, no. okay. Have it. I'm sorry. Anyhow, oh, okay, so her question was a really good question, but the response to it kind of threw me off a little bit. Speaking on attorney's fees, like in family court, I do a lot of family court. Uh -huh. Um, and a lot of times we'll get a final judgment of dissolution of marriage entered and we'll get an order in the final judgment language that is containing saying that husband's attorney's Reserving. entitled. Yeah. They reserve on the amount for an entire reasonableness hearing. Yes. So from an appellate level, uh, excuse me, level, um, yes. the final that judgment is, then would be what? No, 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 no. He, he's saying in the family law arena, and I do plenty of pro bono family law appeals, so this does still apply uh, here. Um, or the appeal makes it pro bono because everybody's lost all their money, um, you get a final judgment of dissolution of marriage. And there's a parenting plan, there's an order to pay alimony, there's an order to pay child support, and then there's a reservation for attorney's fees. Attorney's fees are collateral in that instance, and therefore that is a final order that you need to appeal within 30 days. Then you move forward with the entitlement hearing as fast as you can, and then get it get a final judgment there and appeal that and consolidate, okay? And that it, issue rolled around for an awful long time. There's an old case called, I think it was Patsy versus Patsy, where the court finally said, uh, uh it is a final appealable judgment on everything but the fees, and then you do what Jamie said. 
And, and I think the reason why they do that is because uh, we don't want the fees driving the litigation. Um, and, you know, some people insist on going forward with those hearings. Many other people say, okay, let's see if you get your final judgment reversed and then we'll, because they're going to get fees on appeal. You know what I mean? Which don't just, you know, now we're talking just inside baseball. Uh, your request for fees is a separate motion. It's not in your brief. It's not in your brief. It's not in your brief. It is a separate motion. If they didn't ask for it down below, you can still ask for it on appeal. It is due before the last brief is due. Has somebody already said this because you're shaking? It's due before the last brief is due. Don't screw up and the other side decides not to file a reply brief and you forgot to file your motion for fees. So if you think you have a right to fees with the initial brief, file your motion. If you think you have a right to fees with the answer brief, file your motion. And I think you heard request for oral argument or by separate motion as well. I've, I've seen it in briefs. You know, the court really needs to hear me because I'm super good at this and you need to hear me. Um, and then they don't get oral argument and they don't understand why because they never filed a motion. Any other questions? All right. I guess it's a potty break. Where is it?